Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. Today we want to look in chapter 14. And I want to talk about devastation, then deliverance. Mark chapter 14. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one right there in the pew rack in front of you. And I hope you'll open and look at these verses, please. Well, this last week of the life of Christ before the cross, it was quite eventful to say the least. When he first comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, things are looking real promising. But Jesus knew better. He knew what was fixing to happen. But here all the people and they're singing praises to him. His disciples were. And yet Matthew's gospel records there was still confusion because once he comes in, people were asking this question, who is this? Uh, They didn't even know. Just like so many people in the world today, they have no concept about Jesus Christ, who he is or what he came to do. They just have no understanding of that. That's the way it was back then. Well, Jesus, through that week, through the course of the week, he did different things, but certainly he was teaching, spending time with his disciples. He was letting them know what was going to happen. On the evening of Passover, he gives the Lord's Supper, and then he goes to Gethsemane. And it's his moments in Gethsemane that I want us to think about today because This certainly was no easy time in the life of Christ. First of all, I just want to consider the burdens that Jesus was carrying. Some of you carry great burdens in your life today. You know, the Bible says in 1 Peter, cast all your care, all your burden upon him because the Lord cares for you and he knows about burdens more so than any of us. But what were some of the things that were troubling the Lord Jesus at this time? And there there was more than one thing He knew this, he knew one was going to betray him. And he makes that statement. If you look at verse 17 of Mark chapter 14, it says, When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. And while they were reclining at the table, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. No one likes to think that. If you're sitting with people that you consider to be your friends, and in the case of Jesus, your followers, and yet he knew one of you is going to betray me. And he gave that announcement. And it brought sadness to the lives of the disciples because it says they began to question, well, surely not I, Lord. And uh, they didn't want that to happen. But Jesus knew all along. He knew before this night that that was going to take place. Uh, A long time before this, when he fed the thousands of people, 5,000 men and their families with two fish and five loaves of bread, he then taught them spiritual truths. And most of these thousands turned around and walked away from Christ. But the disciples were still there. And so Jesus said to them, he said, will you also go away? And Simon Peter makes this statement, well, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And Jesus then said this, "Uh, one of you right here is a devil. And I'm sure when Peter made his statement, that Lord, to whom shall we go? All the other disciples would probably chime in and agree with him and shake their heads, not yes, Lord, we're, we believe in you. And yet he turned and said to them right then, one of you right here, one of the twelve, you're a, one is a devil. So Christ knew all about Judas Iscariot and no one else did. The disciples did They trusted him so much they let him carry the, the money box. He used to steal from the money box. But Jesus knew all about him. And when he came to this climactic hour, Here he is, and he's observing Passover, and he makes this statement, one of you right here is fixing to betray me. So that had to weigh on the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's something else that burdened him deeply. He knew the fate of the one who was going to betray him. Look what it says in verse 21 of this text. Jesus said, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. And Jesus isn't saying that with happiness in his heart. This one who's going to betray me, then it's going to be tragic for you. No, he was brokenhearted over that. The Bible says the Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, You and I, people today, if we know individuals that will betray us out here in this world that exists, many people in the world, you know it to be true, they'll tell people all the time, you just go to hell. You go to hell. That's my wish for you. People say that to each other all the time. Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus wasn't excited about the prospect of Judas Iscariot's eternal fate. It grieves him, breaks his heart to think of anyone stepping into an eternity without him and without hope. So that weighed upon Christ. And then the Lord Jesus knew this. He knew all the disciples were going to turn away from him. Look what it says in verse 27. 
Jesus then says, you will all fall away. He told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It's a quote from Zechariah in the Old Testament. But he said, you're all going to fall away. The disciples talked a good game. And Simon Peter, it says in verse 29, he said, even if all fall away, I will not. You can count on me, Lord Jesus. And Jesus tells him, he said, well, I tell you the truth. Uh, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. And Peter insisted emphatically, that will not occur. I will die with you if I have to. And all the others were saying the same thing. Yeah, Jesus knew. He knew that they were all going to go away. They were all going to leave him when it got real tough. So that weighed upon the life of Christ. But what burdened him most was what he was fixing to experience. The tremendous pain and anguish that was going to come. And it was it two types. The physical pain, it was horrendous what Jesus went through. And there are several verses in these chapters that explain that to us. But if you'll just listen to me, they talk like this. They talk about when they take him in, how they spit upon him, how they beat him, how they mocked him. And that's just the beginning part of it. There was a false, false trial, many different facets to this trial, all of which were illegal. They brought in false witnesses to testify against him. And then he was taken to Pontius Pilate. And the Bible says when Pilate turned him over to be crucified, he had him scourged. He was beaten unmercifully with a whip. And this kind of beating, when it took place, would tear out large chunks of flesh from a person's back. So the Lord Jesus Christ was bleeding profusely. And then it says, after all that happened, in verse 16 of, of Mark chapter 15, it said, the soldiers led Jesus away to the palace and called together the whole company of soldiers. And they put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns. And when it says, set it on his head, don't think they were gentle. They pressed that down upon his brow. And then they began to call out to him, said, Hail, King of the Jews. And again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit upon him and they fell on their knees and they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, put on his own clothes, and then they led him out to crucify him. So he's already gone through all that. And then they get to Mount Calvary and then the crucifixion takes place. When a person's dying, that kind of death is horrendous. And Jesus knew. He knew not one person in this room knows the kind of death they're going to die. You don't know the anguish. You don't know whether it'll be quick or whether it'll take a long period of time. But Jesus knew exactly what was happening. But this wasn't the worst part of it. The worst part was what he was going to experience when he took the sins of the world upon himself. And no one knew this. No one knew it. Even though Isaiah had prophesied about it, God had inspired him. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of Saul. I don't even believe Isaiah understood all that. The disciples certainly did not. Jesus said, I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. They didn't comprehend what he was talking about there. But when he was on the cross, the Bible says that the sins of mankind were placed upon him. God made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Nobody knew that. When he's on the cross and he becomes sin for us, the wrath of God against man's sin is poured out upon him, the full measure of that wrath. And Jesus knew that was going to happen. So all those things weighed upon the life of Christ. And when you know that, then you can better understand. Look over here in chapter 14 and verse 34. You can understand why Christ would make this statement right before he goes to Gethsemane. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. My soul is overwhelmed. Devastation. But now I want you to notice this real quick. Look at some of the positive things that Jesus acknowledged himself. One is this. He knew the gospel was going to be preached in all the world. In chapter 14 and verse 9, when he's speaking with the disciples, and this is after this scene where Mary had poured this perfume on his body before him to prepare him for burial. He said, I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, 
What she has done will also be told in memory of her. But he knew the gospel was going to be shared. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 14, Jesus says, before the world is ended, before I come back, this is going to happen. The gospel will be presented throughout the world, all over the earth. It's going to be proclaimed. So that's good news. That's fantastic. Jesus knew that was going to happen. Here's something else that Christ knew. He knew who he was, that he is the king of God's eternal kingdom. Look at the comment in verse 24 of chapter 14. When he's giving the Lord's Supper, he said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. He knew the kingdom of God was real, and he knew he was the king. Christ understood that about his own life. Look in verse 61 and 62 of chapter 14. The high priest are asking him, Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? The son of the blessed one. And Jesus said, I am. That is just who I am. And then he said this, you'll see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, that's fantastic. He knew he was the sovereign Lord and the king of the eternal kingdom. And he said, you're going to see me coming in the clouds of glory. That's powerful. But then Christ also knew this. He knew he would rise from the dead. Look in verse four, chapter 14, verse 28. Jesus just makes this comment after he tells them, all of you will leave me, you'll desert me. But he says, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And it's just a matter of fact. He said, I will rise again. In Matthew chapter 16, this was long before this. Verse 21, when they're at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus makes the statement to them after he tells them that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He will be turned over to the chief priests and the elders, they will beat him. They'll spit upon him. He knew it. He told them this. They'll crucify me, he said. But then he says this, I will rise again. So Christ knew. He knew he was going to come back to life. Now I want you to see all of that. There was the heaviness, the bad that was weighing upon his heart. But here were the positive things, the good things that Jesus could look at and with all that being true, all that going on in the mind of Christ, please notice this. He slipped into the depths of despair. Come back to Mark chapter 14 and verse 34 in that passage and read that again and just look at that. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I am overwhelmed with sorrow. It fills my life. And you'd think, well, now, wait a minute, this is Jesus. And Jesus, sure, he knows he's going to go through some tough times and he's going to be on the cross, but he'll just be there for six hours. And he knows he's going to rise from the grave. I mean, you just say, well, Jesus, Jesus wouldn't be this way. And yet here he is, and he says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Now, look, if that can occur in the life of Christ, all of us know in life things that we face. Of course, we don't face things like Jesus faced, but we can face issues of life that just cripple us emotionally. And sometimes we think to ourselves, you know, Jesus, he couldn't really understand. I'm so overwhelmed with sorrow and sadness and grief in my life, but I don't think God could even understand about this. You know, that's so sad when people feel that way. It says in Hebrews chapter 14, the writer of Hebrews is saying to the believers, listen, we have a high priest not one who is unable to sympathize with us, but one who can because he has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Every temptation, every trial, loss, death, Jesus dealt with that. Death of loved ones, Jesus dealt with that. Temptations, Jesus dealt with that. He carried burdens you and I have never carried, and he went through the depths of sorrow more so than you and I ever will. If you ever think to yourself, he can't understand me, then you need to read about Gethsemane. Because he is crushed under this weight of sorrow. But now let's think about this. There is deliverance. And what's the way out of this sense of dread? The Lord does not want anyone to live their life like this. And Jesus didn't spend all his days like this, not by any stretch of the imagination. What's the way out? How do you get out of this? Well, let's talk about what's not the way out. 
One is this, just weighing the good against the bad, that's not the way out of it. That's not how you lift yourself up out of sorrowful times. That's why I spent time here a moment ago just saying, look, here's all the bad that he was facing right then, and here's the good, here's what he knew. The gospel would be preached. He knew he was king of the eternal kingdom. He knew he would rise from the grave. But I'm going to tell you something, when he's in Gethsemane, he's not in there just doing some mental gymnastics and thing. I'm going to weigh the good against the bad. Sure, here's the cross, and that's bad, but here's all the good. I'll rise from the grave, and I will be the eternal king, and so it's all okay. That didn't deliver him. He didn't do that. That's not how he got out of his sorrow. You and I have to know this. We may know truth mentally in our mind, which is important for us to know that. But when you're knowing it and yet you're experiencing the sorrow and the grief and the heaviness, just you weighing the good against the bad is not going to deliver you from your sadness. It won't. Here's something else that won't. And some of you, this will sound sacrilegious, but it's not. Singing, preaching, teaching, or sharing with others, all that's important to do. It's crucial that we do it, but I want to tell you that won't deliver you. Why, if it would, Jesus wouldn't have had these problems in Gethsemane because look what it says here in verse 26 of Mark chapter 14. After they'd observed the Lord's Supper, and Jesus talked about the kingdom that was to come. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, but they stood up and sung. And when men sing together, and I imagine Jesus had a splendid voice. That had to be moving, stirring. They sang praises. That didn't get him out of his sorrow. And Jesus had been teaching. He'd been preaching. He'd been sharing with his disciples truth. That didn't deliver him from his sorrows. Doesn't it frustrate you sometimes whether you come into this church or some other church and there's great singing that goes on, then you can hear from the Word of God, and yet when you get back to your private life, there's still the heaviness and the sadness, and you just can't shake it. And you think to yourself, you know, that stuff doesn't work. Well, it works. Singing, preaching, teaching, you personally sharing, being a witness for Christ, you bet all that has its place. But that's not the answer for you to be delivered from your deepest times of sorrow. It's just not. Here's something else that won't. If you had some visit, and I believe we do, from an angel. You know, the Bible says angels are ministering spirits sent out to and fro on the earth to minister for the sake of the elect. They minister to us. Luke records, Luke the medical doctor, he records in his account of Gethsemane that when Jesus is going through his agony, an angel comes and ministers to him and strengthens him. And you would think, in fact, just look over here in Luke 22 where you can see it for yourself. Luke chapter 22. You would think once this angel came and strengthened the Lord Jesus that uh, that would just take care of the situation. And yet the Bible says in verse 43, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and yet look what it says. Being in anguish. Now, he's not out of it yet. He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Don't think, well, I just have an angel come and touch me. Minister to me, that'll take care of it. And that'll deliver me from it. Well, no, Jesus had all of that. That's not the way out. Well, if it's not, how do you go from devastation to deliverance? Well, it's exactly the way that Jesus did. It's the only way you can. The way out, and thank God there is a way out, but it is prayer. Jesus went into Gethsemane to pray. He is praying. Now, I know, and I've had people say it to me, well, I'll tell you what, I've tried praying, and it just doesn't work for me. Well, my question to individuals like that, do you pray like Jesus? Because most of the time it's not. So much of us in our prayer life, it's just like, Jesus, I've got this problem, please help me. And then after we say that, then we start analyzing things ourselves. We start carrying ourselves, trying to figure out how we can get ourselves out of these situations. And that's not what Jesus is doing. His prayer life is totally different. Five things characterize what he did here in these verses. 
that if they characterize your life and mine in prayer, this is a way of deliverance. But what is it? What would we say? Well, first of all, he was broken. Jesus Christ, the God-man, was broken when he went into Gethsemane. Look what it says in verse 35 of Mark 14. It says, going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed if it's possible that the hour might pass from him. But he fell to the ground. Jesus didn't go in there thinking this. Maybe the disciples, I've left those three over there, but maybe they can still see me. So I better assume a proper prayer posture. Maybe I better stand like this. Or maybe I better get on my knees and clasp my hands. Or maybe I better stand and hold my hands up toward heaven where I'll look real spiritual. That's not even in his mind. Jesus walks into Gethsemane and with the heaviness of this upon his life, he collapses to the ground. He falls to the ground. He is broken. The Bible talks about the importance of a broken and contrite heart, how that God responds to that, and that's just how the Lord Jesus was. Do you have that kind of brokenness in your life? That kind of desperation in your life? Where you go to him, you just humble yourself. You're not trying to put on a show. You are just humbled before him. That's Jesus. And then there's this about Christ. He was perfectly honest. Look what he says in verse 35 and then verse 36. Once he gets in there, he falls to the ground. He starts his prayer. And he says, if it's possible that this hour might pass, that's what I'm asking for. Verse 36, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. But Jesus is just being gut level honest. And he's saying, if it's possible, let's not do the cross. If you can get me out of this, let's not do this. And he's perfectly honest in what he's saying. Take this cup away from me. Are you honest with the Lord like that? Some people are afraid to say things to God. Listen, he invites you to come to him and tell him all your fears, all your frustrations, all your anxieties, your questions, your doubts, your hurts. You can tell him everything, exactly how you feel. You tell him. Jesus is honest. And then there is this. He was persistent and intense in his praying. He didn't just pray this one time and walk out of Gethsemane. He goes in there and he prays and he prays fervently. And then he goes out to check on the disciples and they're sleeping. And he awakens them and he tells them, he said, you better watch and pray. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. You need to watch and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. But he's challenging them to pray. And then he goes back and he spends more time in praying. And the scripture says he was so intense in this and he was under such stress. Luke the doctor records that his sweat became as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now some people hear that and think, I just think that's being a little dramatic. I don't think something like that can happen. Well certainly that can happen. Uh, There's a medical term for this and I hope I pronounce it correctly, hematidrosis. And this happens, people who've studied this they know what what occurs is that the effusion of blood in one's perspiration, that can happen and a person, instead of just sweating, blood comes forth. And that happens under great periods of stress. A friend of mine who's in the medical profession told me that there's another person in the profession that he had talked with about this. And they looked like in Civil War, and you remember how they fought the Civil War, how they just line up, and which was amazing to me. I mean, the One troop would be over there, the opposing would be here, they'd have their guns just shoot at each other. And some of these people, they knew it was imminent death. And they would have this occurrence take place in them, some of them, because they were so stressed. That's what's going on in the life of Jesus here. This is even after the angel ministers to him. But Christ is in there, he's praying with that kind of intensity. And then he goes out and he checks on the apostles one more time. And then he comes back and he prays more. You know, when you read this in the gospel accounts, it just takes a few verses to tell about his time at Gethsemane. But don't think that was a two-minute deal in there. Jesus runs in prays, Father, if it's possible, take the cup from me. But if it's not, then I'll just do whatever you want. No, he is agonizing. He is intense. He is persistent in his praying. And then there's this. 
The Lord Christ prayed with a trusting heart. He trusted his Father. The statement in verse 36, well, the Lord Jesus, he says, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. It's a terms of endearment. He's not cursing his Father, Abba. In terms of love, deep affection and endearment. And that shows his trust. Trust in him just like a child would trust his father. Jesus had total trust in the father. And then you see it also in this comment that he makes in the passage where he says this, I know this, everything's possible for you. He didn't doubt his father one bit. Everything is possible for you. You know, maybe some of you out here, you think, well, God, in this situation right here, I don't even think you can do anything about it. Jesus never took that attitude. He said, everything is possible for you. And then you see his trust in the Father when he says this, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he's saying, Father, here, here's my heart. If it's possible for me to avoid the cross, then I ask you to do that. But if that's not within your plans or within your will, then your will be done. I trust you that you're doing what is right. Total trust. And then one final thing about the Lord Jesus, he prayed surrendered. When he makes that comment, not my will but thine be done, he's surrendering everything. We sing that song sometimes, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I'll ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. You know, we sing that. How many of us do that? Jesus has this kind of surrendered heart. He's saying, your will, your will be done. I surrender completely to you. Now, you get a good look at him here. When he goes in Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus Christ is overwhelmed. He's restless. He's unsettled. He's grieved. But now you look at him when he comes out of Gethsemane. He is calm, he is at peace, he is courageous, and he is dedicated to doing what his father wanted him to do. Look at these last verses here in this text. In verse 41, when it says, returning the third time, he said to the disciples, are you still sleeping? You still resting? Enough of that. The hour has come. Now, Jesus had made statements throughout his ministry He said, my time is not yet at hand. The hour has not come. He'd say that periodically through his ministry. But now, he says, the hour has come. Look what he says next. He doesn't say, here's the son of man. He's going to be betrayed and the betrayer's coming. So let's get out of here. Let's run from this. No, he doesn't say that. He says, the hour has come. Look, the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And Jesus said, let's just go right to him. I'm ready for this. From devastation to deliverance. And the kind of victory that you see right there in the life of Jesus Christ, I'm saying to you, you can have that in your life. It's not the intent, not the purpose of the Lord that you lived your life in great despair and just totally disoriented in your life, demoralized. No, that's not his plan for you. We go through times where we can be in that mode of that frame of mind, but it's the intent of God that we live with peace, we live with courage, we live with confidence, that we don't fear the future, we can face the future. Listen, the only way out of that, from devastation to deliverance, is prayer. And you've got to pray like Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, the more I read about you, certainly, and I believe all of this would be true for any of us who are believers in here, and when we learn about you, we love you more. And we thank you for just pulling back the curtain and let us see what you went through. And Lord, you were, there was a time where you were just weighed down, and yet you, the God-man, you had deliverance, but it was only through prayer. Well, help us to know we can can play church, 
We can come to church all the time. We can sing. We can share with each other. And that's good. That's so important. But Father, if we're not praying people, well, we're not going to have victory. We're not going to see a movement of your spirit in the lives of others, nor even in our own lives. Father, we won't be delivered from our excessive sorrow that can come upon us. But Lord Jesus, if we'll just follow your example, and we will pray as you pray, just as you came out of that garden triumphant. So, Lord Jesus, can we? And, Father, I pray for anyone who's just weighed down today. I pray your spirit speaks to their heart and lifts them and encourages them. And I pray you just draw them more to a season of prayer. Father, I pray for any in the room who've never received you. I pray, Lord Jesus, you'd work in their hearts. Help them to trust in you. I pray they'd make that decision today and say yes to you as you call to them. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we'll be dismissed in just a moment. If you've never invited Jesus to come into your life to be your Savior, listen, I've got wonderful news for you. You can today. You can meet Christ, the eternal Lord. You can have him as your personal Savior. If you'd like to do that, you'd like to receive Christ, as soon as we're dismissed, I'll be standing here at the front. I just invite you to make your way down here and we'll be more than happy to tell you how you can have Jesus. It might be you're a believer and you're looking for a church, a place where you can serve Christ and you feel like this is where the Lord wants you to be. If that's true of you, we hope you'd come forward and express that to us and we'll tell you, explain how you can be a part here. Listen, if, if you're one of these that you're just struggling in life, but as far as prayer, it's really minimal, Please take to heart this message. That was Jesus' way out, and it's your only way out too. I hope you'll go to him and share with him whatever's on your heart.